singing. Again, thank you all for being here this morning. I know it's an interesting title, ain't it? I misquoted it somehow. I, I know it's right back there, but when I first sent it, I don't know, I was just busy, and so I, they understood. Yeah, but that's a pretty good one. If you've never seen The Wizard of Oz, I don't know what you've been, what you've been doing with your life. Not the greatest movie, but, I mean, you got to watch it at least once. Uh, but uh, if you want to turn with me this morning to the Gospel of John, that's where we will be at this morning, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 8, that is where our text is going to be at, and you'll understand the title uh, when you read the verse, uh, it makes a little bit more sense. We're not watching a clip of the movie, uh, it's just the title. And so John uh, chapter 3 is where our text is at, and we're just going to look at verse number 8. In John chapter 3, verse 8, and uh, this is what the scripture says to us this morning. John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus says these words, The wind bloweth where it listeth or wishes, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. Whether it goeth, so it is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And we'll read that one more time. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for another day to open up your word. Thank you for another day for those of us who belong to you to come together and to magnify your name in spirit and in truth. And this morning as we look at verse 8, I pray that you would give us the truth that is found inside of it. I pray that you would give us the pure word. And that we would yield to it, not just listen and hear it, but take it to our lives and hide it within our hearts. And so that we would walk closer to you and be better servants. And Father, whatever you see fit to do this morning, we'll be cautious to give you the glory and honor. We ask all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. When arriving at a powerful verse like this one here in verse 8, and just by reading the rest of the Bible, you quickly learn that entering into the kingdom of God only comes from being born again. And this imagery of being born again draws our attention to the very truth that we did nothing to contribute to salvation. That is definitely true when it comes to our first birth. I would like for anybody in here to stand up and say they had something to do with their first birth. None of us did. I mean, can anybody really say that they contributed to that? Did you decide the parents that you have? No. Did, did you pick and decide the day you was going to be born? Absolutely not. You had no control over it. And when Jesus tell, talks to us and talks to Nicodemus about being born again, this rebirth, we find that it is a sovereign act of God Himself. Just like we did nothing to contribute to the first birth, the second birth, the spiritual birth is the exact same way. Being born again is an independent work of God as he works in the hearts of all of those he will save. Reading James Montgomery Boyce, I really loved what he had to say about this. It's going to be a little lengthy, but it was really good. He says, clearly God uses this imagery because it alone 
shows the initiative that lies with the father entirely, not with the son or the daughter. He says, what did you have to do with your birth? Did you say, I would like to be a boy or a girl? I would like to be born to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They seem like a nice couple. He says, of course you didn't. You had nothing to do with it. Instead, your father met your mother, and between them became you. And you only realize what happened afterwards. It is therefore obvious that when God uses this image of being born again, he does so so that he alone is responsible for your salvation, and you only believe because he first created life within you to do it. End quote. You see, that is exactly what happens in the new birth. You see, new, the new birth precedes saving faith. You must be brought to life before there is ever any repentance and faith to be found. But notice that a rebirth also produces saving faith. God is always coming first. He is always ahead of the crowd in salvation. He is the one who initiates it. He carries it, carries it out, and he carries it through. And this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, it lasts for several verses, not just here in verse 8, but it lasts for uh, quite a while, and you can read the rest of it. But this conversation that they have, it is one of the most important passages in all of the Bible. Because within this conversation, you find Jesus giving such a strong declaration about two things, the new birth and faith in the Son of God. And for all of us who do belong to Christ, it will be of our best interest to really study the deep truths that lie within this chapter. Not just glancing it over, not just reading it because we got to, but really rolling up our sleeves and digging into the great and deep truths in this passage. For all of us, or for all of those who may not be believers, it would be best to get a grasp on what is being said. Because a man can be clueless about a whole lot of things when it comes to religion, and the man can still be saved. But to be ignorant about the truths found within this chapter and within this verse is to be on the broad road that leads to destruction. So as we begin to look at and dissect verse 8, I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. All of verse 8 is coming out of the mouth of our Lord. No one else is talking. It's just Jesus. And listen to how he is using the analogy between the Spirit of God and salvation and how the wind blows. But remember, as he is speaking about these things, as he is comparing them, do not forget that a man must be born of the Spirit of God before he can enter into the kingdom of God. And listen to what he says in verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. I want us to look at the first truth this morning, and that is that the wind is independent. Look at verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, or wisheth. What this literally is telling us is that the wind will blow wherever the wind wants to blow. You can easily say the wind is in control, it has a mind of its own, it will blow wherever it wants, and man will not have any control over it. It is so simply beyond man's power. Now, at times, I do wish I could control the wind. Let's just be honest, you do too. Especially on days that are absolutely windy. We've experienced those recently. Uh, I, I, for some, I mean, at times, when it gets so windy, you get in your car and you feel like you're going to get picked up and thrown across the state like a little Lego. Uh, but the truth is, I can't control it. I would also like to control the wind when it's an extremely hot day and there is no wind at all, I would like to have the wind to blow just a little bit so, you know, that I could cool off. But no matter what I wish and no matter what I desire or want, I cannot control the wind. The weatherman thinks he can, though. 
he, he'll get on the news and he'll tell us the wind's going to go right through this path. It's going to be this strong and at, from this time to this time, this is when the wind is going to strike. But as soon as he gets done saying that, the wind is all the way over here. It's not even going the way he said. It's going in the complete opposite direction. And that just proves nobody has control over the wind. It's going to blow where it wants, when it wants, wherever it wants. It's going to go its own way. And so it is with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will move over one heart, but at other times it will pass over another heart. Have you ever noticed that with some families? You look at a family and some of them are believers. Others are not believers. You go to work and some, you know, you got some few co-workers that are believers and the rest of the crowd's not. I mean, why is it that the Spirit blows upon some and not upon others? What's the reason? Well, the reason is because the Spirit of God blows upon who He wishes. You see, the Spirit of God can blow upon individual within a church service and that individual will be saved, he can blow upon an individual as they're just sitting on the front porch, and they will be saved. And I believe what we can draw from the first half of verse 8 is that the Spirit of God is independent. It blows not according to our wishes, not according to our commands, but it blows according to the sovereign will of God and that alone. God does not act or carry out actions according to our authority. He doesn't do it on our agenda. He doesn't act according to our plans. But the Spirit of God blows upon the all-wise plan of God and God alone. I love what Pink said about this. He said, the wind is an element altogether beyond man's control. He said, the wind neither consults man's pleasures, nor can it be regulated by his devices. So it is with the Spirit. The wind blows where it pleases, when it pleases, and as it pleases. End quote. When we look at the first half of verse 8, looking at the comparison, and we cannot without a doubt, there is no possible way a man cannot say, that he is absolutely in control in salvation. He is in control of salvation. He is completely sovereign in salvation. I mean, let's just be honest for a moment. When a lot of people, once knowing that little truth about the Spirit of God, you will find a lot of people balling up their fists, turning red in the face because God is not acting according and moving according to their pleasures, wants, and desires. And I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. You are not God today. He is God. You will never be God. I am not God. I mean, what makes us so great and majestic that God should move in a way we see fit? We don't even know what we need tomorrow. Let's be honest. We don't even know what we need in our day-to-day -day life half of the time. That's why we call people and ask what we should do. We don't know what we need to do. And then we think God should move this way and not that way. I'm going to be honest with you. He moves as he wishes. His ways is higher than your ways. And they're higher than mine. He will do what he wants, when he wants, as he wants. He's not only independent, but notice that the wind is found to be irresistible in the text. It says, the, blow, the wind bloweth where it lists. So the, the wind's blowing where it wishes, right? We've already covered that. The wind is going to blow. So when the wind does blow in the fullness of its power, we all know that it's going to absolutely sweep away everything that's in its path, right? We know that. Now, I'm sure many of us have been in some pretty powerful windstorms, right? Maybe some of us have been caught in a hurricane or two. But when that wind really starts to pick up power and speed, we 
y'all see the effects of it. We see homes absolutely destroyed. We see cars being picked up and rolled over like some Hot Wheel toy, like it's nothing. Trees and bushes are snapped like little twigs. I mean, if we were to really be honest, it is amazing how powerful the wind can really get. But no matter how fast or even how soft and slow the wind is blowing, no matter the speed or force, there ain't a one of us in here that can stop it. I mean, if you think you're so mighty, go out there today and tell it to stop. I'll I'll laugh at you when you do it because you can't stop it. Nobody can stop the wind. The only person who controls the wind is God himself. None of us can tell the wind to stop. There is not an individual who is that powerful because the wind is so overpowering and it overpowers absolutely everything in its path. Again, here's the comparison. So it is with the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God blows upon an individual's heart to regenerate them, what happens is that he breaks down man's rebellion. He overcomes man's objection to the gospel. He overcomes all opposition that he has, and he takes away all excuses that the individual has on why he didn't commit his life to Jesus Christ and decided to go his own way. But when the Spirit of God does blow upon the heart, And he does regenerate them. And he does convert them. All of those excuses are swept away. That is how powerful God is. God's not trying to save people. He is saving people. Okay? He's powerful. He doesn't doesn't need a little boost from the congregation. He doesn't need us to, to push them and get them going like you do a little kid as they're learning to ride the bicycle. He does it because he is that powerful. And when the Spirit of God blows, all excuses are swept away, knocks down our unbelief, and he activates our will. I love what the Puritan John Owen said about it. He says, when the Holy Spirit intends to regenerate a person, he removes all obstacles, he overcomes all resistance, and he overcomes all opposition. And here John Owen gives the final death blow and infallibly produces the result he intended. If God is going to save someone, you can mark it down, he's going to save that person. This again shows how powerful God is in salvation. How powerful he is in general. Now, many would like to object this. Many would like to say this isn't so because God doesn't make men willing. Men are already willing. That's what, men, that's what a lot of people would like to argue. But the truth is, that's just not the case. Listen to what the psalmist said. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And by the way, let's just clear the air. Let's go ahead and throw all of the chips in. Men are not willing by nature. End of discussion. By nature, men and women want nothing to do with God. Listen to Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Here's the true teaching. Men want nothing to do with him by birth, by nature. They want nothing to do with him. They hate him. You say, that's not true about me. Me and God have always gotten along. I've always been a believer. No, you haven't. No one has been a Christian their whole life. It's impossible. None of us in here have been a believer our whole life. At one point, you were lost. At one point, you were enmity against God. You wanted nothing to do with Him. You didn't want to do it. You wanted nothing to do with the God of the Ten Commandments. You wanted nothing to do with the God of the Bible who orders you around your daily affairs and your business. You want nothing to do with this holy and righteous God who passes over some and blows upon others. 
natural man doesn't want this God. They don't want the God of the Ten Commandments. They don't want the God that tells them, if you, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. They don't want that. They, they want the God who it, it just all love. It doesn't cost nothing to follow Jesus. It's not going to hurt me. It's going to be completely comfortable. We want that one. But thank God for those of us who are converted. While we were yet in that position, in, in that condition, when we wanted nothing to do with Him, while we were rebels and enemies of God, as Paul tells us in Romans, while we were constantly rebelling against Him and breaking His law, the Spirit of God came to where we were at, blew upon our dead hearts, regenerated us, made us alive in Him. And that is why we can echo what the psalmist he brought me also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto God. And many shall see and fear it and shall trust in the Lord. That is why we can echo those words. And the reason, because of Him. It's not because of you this morning. It's not because of me. It's because God is saved you that is it we didn't make the right choices in life therefore we're Christians it's not because we made the right petitions therefore we're believers no the reason any man is born of the spirit is because the spirit of God revealed unto you your wickedness your sinfulness and showed you who you were pointed you to Christ and regenerated you by his power that's it. The, the wind in the Spirit of God is independent. It moves as it wishes. It doesn't act according to our plans and our agenda. He's irresistible. Ain't nobody here who can tell God stop. If, if, if he was going to do something, if he set his mind to do something, who in here is powerful enough to stop the Almighty One who created the universe by just speaking it. Nobody can. But He ain't just that. He's also inscrutable, mysterious. The movement of the wind goes beyond any of our explanations. It goes beyond all of our efforts to predict where it's going to go next. And that's the case with the Spirit of God. So many times within a family or a certain circle or a group, we like to think that there is, there's that one person we just know that's the next person God's going to save. He, he, he's just right there. But many times it doesn't happen. And then you have that other instance where you have that one individual who is just so furthest away from God in our eyes. He's like the Saul of Tarsus. You couldn't get any further. But then you see the wind blow in his direction. And it suddenly and instantly, you find that that is the one that God birthed into his kingdom. How mysterious are the ways of God? Man just cannot predict when and where the wind's going to blow. Man also cannot predict the operation of the Spirit of God. And if you say you can, I would like to tell you you're going against Scripture. Listen to Ecclesiastes 11.5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. You just can't put your finger on it, can you? You can't figure God out. I'm sorry. I don't care if you teach Sunday school, if you're a deacon, whatever. You can't figure God out. And if you figured him out, he ain't the God of the Bible. He's a God in your mind. But don't just listen to Ecclesiastes. Do you remember what Paul said at the end of Romans 11? After he gave several chapters of nothing but doctrine, hammered the depravity of man, talked about justification, talked about reconciliation, 
holy living, assurance of salvation, election, predestination, covered it all. And he comes to Romans eleven thirty three, and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counsel? Paul is saying, nobody can figure him out. Ain't nobody in this room today can figure him out. And if when it's over, if you like to tell me you can, I'll just smile at you and just say, okay. Because according to Scripture, we can't. Now, there are certain things, do not get me wrong, we see for sure what he will do. He will save. But how? Tell me the operation therein. Tell me where he's moving next and what's going. I can't do it. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? What's the answer? Nobody. No one knows, not one of us, because God is so independent. God is so irresistible. He is so inscrutable. Man just can't put his finger on it today. His ways are higher than ours. Again, A.W. Pink said this, The wind bloweth, there's the fact. And thou hearest the sound thereof, there's the evidence of the fact. But knowest not whence? There is the mystery behind the fact. Pink said, the one who is born again knows that he has a new life and enjoys the evidence of it. But how the Holy Spirit operates upon the soul, subdues the will, creates the new life within us. I love it. He says, it belongs to the deep things of God. Now, don't misunderstand me. We got, we, we got to say this, the, the very high spiritual crowd, they you know that's way better than all of us, you know, that, they're going to tell us how, what God's going to do next, I mean, that, that's just how they are, they're, they're going to tell us he's going to do this there, and over here he's going to do this and that, they got it figured out, but be honest, don't listen to them, just turn your backs to them, and just look at the scripture, now John has given us a glimpse of this already. He's already kind of touched on this earlier in this gospel. If you look over in John chapter 1 with me, verse 12 and 13, this is what the scripture says here in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as have received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Notice something. Verse 12 is the human aspect, the human side. But verse 13 is the cause of it all. Verse, tw verse 12, we see the effects of it. People are receiving Christ in their life, and they're believing on his name. But how, do, how does someone receive Christ? How is someone brought to the, the, to the position where they believe on him? Well, verse 13 is the answer if you just read your Bible. Listen to what verse 13 says. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John gives us three negatives on how someone is not born into the kingdom of God. But then he gives us one positive truth on how someone is. We're going to go through them. The first one in verse 13, not of blood. What does that mean? It means just because your parents are Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you were raised in a Christian home, that doesn't make you a Christian. I mean, just because I sit in the garage doesn't make me a car, right? right? That makes sense, don't it? Therefore, just because you were raised in a Christian home, that doesn't make you a Christian. See, God has a lot of children, but he does not have any grandchildren. It must come from a direct and divine relationship to him. It has nothing to do with the birthright, nothing to do with the family tree. I don't care if your grandma taught Sunday school. It don't make you a Christian. 
I don't care if your dad was a deacon. Doesn't mean you're a Christian. None of that makes anybody a Christian. It's not of blood, but he also said, nor the will of the flesh. What does this mean? This deals with your own effort, with your own work. No matter how hard you try today in the religious circle, you will never make it. Period. You're not going to. You can't be good enough today. That goes against so many messages. That just ruined a lot of preaching we'll hear. You can't be good enough. Sorry. You're not. I'm not. But you also can't take away the sin you've also committed. There's two negatives right there. You can't do it. So quit trying. But thirdly, he says, nor of the will of man. You see, your will, as Paul says, was dead in trespasses and sin. It's in bondage to sin. And everybody wants to boast about our will. You see, your free will went in only one direction, and that was to sin. It never went to God. Never. We just looked at the scripture. Man is enemies of God. Why would, we go, why would he go to him? He's enemies. He ain't going to. He's dead in trespasses and sin. The only direction you were going was down in sin, never up towards God. There it is. We weren't going up. We were going down, down, down. But the positive aspect, says this is how you got in but of God this means salvation only comes from the will of God it wasn't done by your family tree it wasn't done by works it's only been done by the will of man that eliminates everything that you can conjure up that leaves you like a sitting duck you're hopeless you're helpless. You need something. What is it? John says, but of God. If you are saved today, it is but of God. That is the only thing we can say about our salvation. It is only by the grace of God that any man is saved today. It's not Jesus and my decision. I'm saved. If it's Jesus plus anything else, that gives us no gospel. It's Jesus plus nothing. That gives us the truth. It's all about him. He's the one that did the work. He's the one that reconciled us. He is the one who has done it all. It is because he had mercy on whom he would have mercy. It is because he would show compassion on whom he would show compassion. And this great salvation that some of us are enjoying right now didn't take place because we did it there ain't nobody in heaven that's going to be able to point to the number on their back and say look at me boy i'm so glad i made the right decision ain't you boy i'm so glad i went to the altar and ain't nobody saying that the only thing you're going to be able to say is because of him it's only because of him. And if you're holding on to Christ and something else, I would be terrified this morning. Because it's not something else and Christ. It is just Christ. Period. That, that, that is why it is just so hated. Because man can't do anything. He is helpless. He is hopeless. He realizes that he has sinned and went against God, and there is nothing he can do about it. He is helpless. The only hope he has is for God to show mercy to him. He prays that God and the Spirit of God would blow in his direction. You say, now what's our response to this? Well, if we are saved, echo the words of the songwriter when he penned the words down all praise to him whose love is seen in Christ the son the servant king who left behind his glorious throne to pay the ransom for his own 
All praise to him who humbly came to bear our sorrows, sin, and shame. Who lived to die, who died to rise, the all-sufficient sacrifice. If you're not a believer, the only hope you have this morning is that the Spirit of God blows in your direction. And he regenerates you for his glory and for his honor. Work yourself to death, you'll just be tired at the end of the day. You'll probably take years off your life. I don't know. You'll just you'll work yourself to death. But what I would tell you to do is look to him. Quit trying to do it yourself. You contributed nothing to your first birth. You do nothing to the second. You say, now we did repent and we have faith. You're absolutely right. But what God does require, he also gives. Had he not given you faith and repentance, there would have never been any repentance shown. He gives faith. So tell me that how can a dead man repent? Go out to, we don't have a graveyard, do we? I don't think we do. I've never seen one. Go to some graveyard. Go to your parents. I don't know. Ask them how their day's been. You'll be sitting there until you die. It's the same thing spiritually. You are a lifeless corpse to nothing. But he came, quickened you, made you alive, gave you repentance and faith. And that is why you believe in him. Turn to him. That's it. This should really turn our hearts to worship him this morning. That he did this work you realize you couldn't do anything? You couldn't. It's impossible. Had he had not done this for you, you would still be lost and wherever wherever you'll be at, you wouldn't be here. Probably, I don't know. Some of you had religion. You would probably be. I don't know. You wouldn't be in attendance. about you, but I can't help but to praise him for that. I praise him for not knowing his ways. If he wanted me to know right now, he he, he, he would have told me. He would have laid it out there in his word. His ways are so far above ours. And so whatever it is for you this morning, just, just worship him if you're a believer. Thank God he is independent. Thank God he is irresistible. He, he, thank God he did break down the walls of rebellion. Thank God he is mysterious. And whatever it is, you go to him. Because he is the all-sufficient one. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you have given us. Father, we are so thankful that you are independent. Lord, you do not act according to our commands. We do not order you around in life. God, you do that to us. We are your creation. Father, we're so thankful you're irresistible. No man can stop the wind. And Father, no man can stop you. Father, we are so thankful that you are inscrutable. Your ways are just far above ours. And we worship you for that because we realize how finite we really are. And if we were to be honest, we don't know what we need half the time in our daily life. We, may, we want to put on the show like we do. We'll tell everybody in the church that we got it figured out. And when we lay our head on the pillow and we have our thoughts to ourselves, we begin to squirm and wonder at what we're going to do next. But we're so thankful that you are above us, that your thoughts and ways are higher. Because if they weren't, if they were on our level, Father, we know this, and you know that you wouldn't be much of a God, but thank and praise your name that you are. And whatever the congregation needs this morning from you, Pray that you would be merciful to them. 
Maybe they rebelled against you throughout the week with some sin. Didn't whatever whatever it may be. I pray that you still be gracious. And then you would do it for your glory and honor. For your praise. Bless all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Let's stand and sing fifty four.